We're going to continue our conversation in just a few minutes, but first we have a short video giving a brief history of the Internet. Let's go ahead and roll that tape. On October 4th in 1957, during the Cold War, the first unmanned satellite, Sputnik 1, was sent into orbit by the Soviet Union. The fear of a missile gap emerged. In order to secure America's lead in technology, the US founded the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency in February 1958. At that time, knowledge was only transferred by people. The DARPA planned a large-scale computer network in order to accelerate knowledge transfer and avoid the doubling up of already existing research. This network would become the ARPANET. Furthermore, three other concepts were to be developed which are fundamental for the history of the Internet. The concept of a military network by the RAND Corporation in America. The commercial network of the National Physical Laboratory in England and the scientific network Cyclades in France. The scientific, military and commercial approaches of these concepts are the foundations for our modern internet. For the first connections between the computers the network working group developed the network control protocol. Later on the NCP was replaced by the more efficient transmission control protocol. The specific feature of the TCP is the verification of the file transfer. Since the NPL network was designed on a commercial basis, a lot of users and file transfer were expected. In order to avoid congestion of the lines, the sent files were divided into smaller packets, which were put together again at the receiver. Packet switching was born. In 1962, American ferret aircraft discovered middle and long-range missiles in Cuba, which were able to reach the United States. This stoked fear of an atomic conflict. At that time, information systems had a centralized network architecture. To avoid breakdown during an attack, a decentralized network architecture had to be developed, which, in case of loss of a node, would still be operative. Another milestone followed with the development of the French network Cyclades. Since Cyclades had a far smaller budget than ARPANET, and thus also fewer nodes, the focus was laid on the communication with other networks. In this way, the term Internet was born. Inspired by the Suclades network and driven by the incompatibility between the networks, their connection gained in importance everywhere. The phone companies developed the X.25 protocol, which enabled communication through their servers, in exchange for a monthly basic charge, of course. DARPA's transmission control protocol was to connect the computers through gateways and the International Organization for Standardization designed the OSI reference model. The innovation of OSI was the attempt to standardize the network from its ends and the channel's division into separate layers. Finally, the TCP assimilated the preferences of the OSI reference model and gave way to the TCP IP protocol, a standard which guaranteed compatibility between networks and finally merge them, creating the Internet. And that was our video of the history of the Internet, and I'm back speaking with Bill Davidow, author of the new book, Overconnected. Now, I think the Internet today has far exceeded what all the people who created it ever expected it to do. Uh, and it's obviously brought enormous benefits, but it also carries some risks. Now, if the Internet has risks, do you think there's anything we need to do that could reduce the risks of overconnectedness? Well, uh, there are lots of things that I would do differently. Uh, one of the things that happens is that all throughout society, you've got these positive feedback processes. They happen in social situations. Uh, for example, you, you have a uh, uprising in Libya, and that happens because of a thought contagion, which is a positive feedback process, 
and we know that the internet was involved in stimulating that. Well, I happen to think that the revolution or the change of power in Libya was an absolutely great thing, and so I would view that as a positive effect of a positive feedback. But the reality of the situation is that we are going to create more volatile social situations because of the positive feedback processes that can be fostered because of the internet. Well, there's a concern that the internet can accelerate conflicts. In the old days, if one world leader insulted another one, it might take weeks for the other person to find out and then weeks for a message to get back. Now, everything is instantaneous. You could say something, you don't even know that your microphone is on and all of a sudden, the whole world knows it and it creates problems. Well, so the Danish cartoonists that did the distasteful cartoons of Mohammed and pretty soon there are riots around the world and uh, that probably would not have happened prior to the internet. So those are some of the, the, the social consequences of it and those can be uh, both you know, good and bad. Uh, there are economic situations where uh, these things happen and uh, the economic situations, things can race out of control pretty easily. You mentioned in the book uh, the case of Iceland, which had a big internet bubble. Maybe you could give a very brief recap of that, just so the v uh, viewers know well, what that example would uh, be. Sure. In the case of Iceland, uh, here was this little economy in the middle of the North Atlantic, 500 miles from anywhere and it had a gross domestic product of around $15 billion a year. Suddenly, its banks ended up with $150 billion worth of assets because they could engage in all the financial markets of the world. And all that they were required to do was to have deposit insurance for their depositors. Well, it turns out that there's no way that a $15 billion economy can have that kind of deposit insurance. So here was something where a law that is very reasonable, says have deposit insurance, um, would have been fine if Iceland's banks had had $10 billion in assets. Suddenly they have $150 billion worth of assets and they have uh, inadequate deposit insurance and the whole country goes bankrupt because of this. Um, so uh, those types of things happen in these internet driven environments. So the speed at which you can move money, and that also raises issues like online gambling. Um, somebody in Russia can set up a gambling site and some place in the United States where that's illegal, you can gamble and lose your life savings without even leaving your living room. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, it, but you, you could go to Las Vegas and do that, but you but, have But all, that takes effort. Yeah. Here, you don't even have to get go. out of your, you don't even have to get out of your pajamas. You're, you're right, and uh, one of the things that has interested me about the internet is, and I was t talking a little bit earlier with you about this, is that uh, we spent 150,000 generations evolving to live in a physical environment, and our brain chemistry is not appropriate for virtual environments. So. Uh, what we're finding is that these virtual environments are hijacking our brain chemistries, which were designed for physical environments, and that is one of the reasons why we think people have so much trouble putting down smartphones. Mm -hmm. And it's the same type of brain chemistry uh, hijacking that caused gambling addiction. So uh, you, you have these things going on, and uh, we just uh, are into some really interesting situations. 